Welcome everyone to our second um, fall quarter 2020 uh, meeting of Materia, the research group. I'm Hector Rojos, an associate professor of Iberian and Latin American cultures, along with my co-chairs, Jimena Briseño, Lea Pao, and Romina Weinberg. Uh, we are very privileged, very happy, very uh, fortunate to have with us Maria Rosaria Costa Lopez and Tim Campbell. Uh, I won't be introducing you guys just yet. I just want to give everyone a warm welcome to our meeting. These are challenging times the world over, still under a uh, pandemic and uh, pending a very decisive vote count in the US. Uh, some of us grieving from um, a tragedy, and I don't know if that is the word to describe it, but I'll use it, um, in Vienna a couple of days ago uh, that hit close to home for some of us. So many things are happening and this is all the more reason I think to, I mean, A, thank you all for being here. I, I see we have close to 20 participants on a day like today that is great and on any day really in the smaller Stanford uh, events that we have. And that I think is first of all a testament to the interest in our speakers work and also um, something that bears witness to the kind of continuity that we've had in Materia for six years or so now, uh, trying to keep the anthropocentric discussion uh, alive, undead, and anything in between uh, at Stanford. Um, in terms of how we're going to operate today, um, after these quick welcome remarks, um, uh, Jimena Briseño is going to introduce Professor Campbell. Uh, Professor Pao is going to introduce Professor Acosta. Um, and then we'll hear the two talks back to back. We find that that format works well uh, on Zoom and otherwise. Um, each of our speakers will speak for roughly 15 minutes. Um, the remarks might be more um, informal than there would be in an actual uh, classroom as befits the Zoom format as well. And after we've had the two presentations back to back, we're going to open it up to discussions and conversation and we'll promote, quote unquote, uh, those of you who are uh, presently attendees in Zoom parlance into panelists, which means we'll get to see your likenesses and we'll get to interact as in a normal classroom. Um, thank you all for being here, um, Jimena. All right, um, it is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Timothy Campbell to Materia. Um, it's been quite a long time since my Cornell years. <laughs> Tim is professor in the Department of Roman Studies at Cornell University, in addition to having translated Robert Esposito's Bios, Biopolitic and Philosophy, Minnesota from 2008, and Communitas, The Origin and Destiny of Community from Stanford in 2010. He is most recently the author of Techne of Giving, Cinema and the Generous Form of Life from Fordham University Press from 2017. He also edits the series Commonalities for Fordham University Press. Currently, he's completing a project on power and the comic self. And today, um, I don't have the, wait. I don't have the title of your talk, Tim. I was but counting I'm on sure you. That, <laughs> but I'm sure that you will have it. Uh, you in would, you any would be case, wrong. <laughs> in any case, it's it's really it's really wonderful to have you, and we are so pleased to have you in in a day like today. Thank you so much. Um, Lea, please. Yeah. Uh, hi everyone. Um, I'm very excited to. Um, uh, introduce to you uh, Maria uh, Rosario Costa Lopez, who is a full professor at the Department of Hispanic Studies uh, at the UC Riverside. Uh, her work is on uh, historical memory uh, with uh, survivors um, of police torture in Chicago and also with survivors of political violence in Colombia. Uh, and this work has informed her current book project, uh, Grammars of Listening, Philosophical Approaches to Memory After Trauma, uh, of which we'll get a, a little uh, taste today. Uh, she's also completing two uh, forthcoming uh, books, uh, one in Spanish uh, that's on uh, community um, uh, and uh, Hegel, Nancy, Esposito, and Agamben, and another one in English uh, that uh, uh, with the title The Unstoppable Murmur of Being Together, which is co-authored with uh, Jean-Luc Nancy and the group on law and violence. 
Uh, and she's also working on a long-term project on Friedrich Schiller, which I'm very excited about as a Germanist, mm -hmm. that is titled Aesthetics uh, as uh, uh, Critique. So uh, thank you all for being here. And uh, please join me uh, virtually in, in, in welcoming uh, Professor Lopez and Professor Campbell today. Welcome everyone. If that's okay, Maria Rosario, would you do the honors first? Sure, whatever works. Well, thank you. Thank you everyone for being here. As Hector mentioned in such a hectic, weird times that we're living. Um, as I always say anyway, when you come from Latin America, the hecticness is kind of part of our everydayness. So this hecticness is here, unfortunately, for the unfortunate reasons that those are, makes me feel a little bit less foreign to the United States. I kind of feel I understand the grammars of what's going on better now because I can relate it more to the kind of chaos and lack of institutionality that I am familiar with in politics in Latin America. But it is not a good reason uh, to be familiar to something, I guess. Um, I'll start and it's really a pleasure for me also to share the stage. We lost her. There, there is no Zoom event without technical issues. It's, it's just <laughs> part and parcel. Uh, <laughs> Let, let Does us wait know, for though, uh, that we can uh, I will let her know via what I, 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 I just let her know. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Well, we'll see. <laughs> Not, nothing that a good restart won't take care of. Hey, Maria Rosario. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to do Goodbye. something. Just in case, I'm going to connect also from my phone. Um, so just in case, connect. This is a different Wi-Fi. This meeting is being recorded. And I'm going to mute. So, yep. Can you hear me there? Perfect, and there's no feedback. Exactly. Yeah. Now it's working. It works. Great. It works well. Super. I need the computer though because I have a presentation, but the presentation is not. I mean, if I disconnect, I'll continue on the phone and we'll do it that way. Okay. So I'm going to share the screen. Uh, here. And I haven't figured out how to, oh, there it goes. Can you see the presentation there? Hmm, I couldn't do this before. Okay. Uh, could, you, could you try to move to the next slide just in case? Because I know that sometimes it's tricky. Yes, yep. everything is working fine. Yep. Right. Okay. So uh, the paper I shared with the group is a long paper and I realized when I was trying to come up with like a short version of the paper that it, it is not possible in 15 minutes to cover both parts of the paper. So I'm going to concentrate mainly on the first part because the first part is kind of the context, philosophical context to the, the project as a whole, which is the project on grammars of listening. So the paper has two parts. It goes first, it goes through the path from a philosophical approach to the question of memory and history in the aftermath of trauma. And that's what I'm mainly going to be talking about today. And it also 
it, it also goes it also goes afterwards to the decolonizing potential involved in rethinking memory and history philosophically coming out of a trauma of trauma studies uh, but more specifically coming out of an understanding of trauma as a colonizing form of violence so that's kind of the move i do in the paper from one side from the first part of the project to the second one i'm going to concentrate mainly on what i call grammars of listening um, just to give you a general idea of what's going on in the project. And then I can go into details during the discussion. Um, first, a bit of a just not the theoretical context, but the opposite. Uh, as um, Leah was saying when she was introducing me, I, this work, which is the book is a philosophical approach to memory and history after trauma. In the book, I don't specifically speak about the kind of experience that I have um, the honor to have. I had the honor to have working with survivors of political violence in Colombia and survivors of, of um, police torture in Chicago, which I also qualify as political violence. Um, I don't speak explicitly about that in the book because I tend not to, I don't like to involve the voices of the people I work with as objects of a study in my work. I have a very uncomfortable relation to that kind of work, especially in a book on philosophy. But I always have to uh, give credit to the people I work with and the people that have allowed me to do the work with them. And I don't know why here. So the first side of it is my work in Colombia with communities that were survivors, mainly of paramilitary violence, but also of guerrilla violence in some occasions. Most of my work was in the north part of the country, and it was in connection to the Colombian National Historical Memory Center. Um, back then, the Historical Memory Center, under the, under the direction of Gonzalo Sanchez, was really committed to uh, giving voice to the survivors, victims of paramilitary violence, uh, political violence, guerrilla violence, and survivors also of violence produced by the army. Right now, the center has moved politically in a different direction and is actually trying to institutionally silence the voices that the previous work done in the center was trying to make audible. Um, so that's like a huge problem right now in Colombia. But during the time I was working for the center, I had the privilege to work with a lot of communities uh, in relation to producing reports. These reports are reports that once you, once you write them, they are a combination of memory and history as historical memory itself uh, kind of tells. So um, they come with a lot of archival research a lot of historical research of sources, different kinds of sources, and they combine that with the work we do with communities uh, recovering testimonies regarding a specific forms of violence. Each report is connected to a very specific form of violence. The center calls it a paradigmatic case because in each case, the name is not the best for what it is, but in each case, they try to make visible one of the sides of the way paramilitary violence or guerrilla violence was operating in the country. Um, and this combination between testimony, historical research, archival work, legal work too, is what gives way to the reports that then are shared and are publicly shared, uh, accessible to everyone in the country, accessible to everyone via website. And they come also with other forms of representation. Sometimes we do documentaries, sometimes there are photographic exhibitions, sometimes there is, there are other ways of sharing with the community first and then from the community to with the country uh, what the community wanted to make visible about their way of surviving, their resilience, their resistance strategies, but also the kind of violence they had to go through. And that's uh, the experience with the Colombian National Historical Memory Center. And then when I got to Chicago, I had uh, the honor to, to be contacted by a group of people called the Chicago Torture Justice Memorials. And this is a group of a collective mainly of artists, um, but also activists and uh, survivors of 
police torture in the city. And they have been, they had been, by the time they contacted me in 2015, fighting for years for a legal recognition of the fact that um, these survivors had been tortured when they were interrogated um, between 1972 and 1991. And the, the head of the police back then was John Birch. And what makes this case particularly special in connection to police violence in the United States is that this is the first case that, had, that has been recognized by a legal instance as police torture and has pro, uh, provided the survivors with a reparations package. And the reparations are both, sim uh, are both symbolic and economic. So they were given by the city of Chicago, besides money as indemnization for what happened to them, they were offered um, the possibility of building a memorial, which is still in the works, because of course the city hasn't given the money yet, but it is a promise that the city made to them. Uh, and they could create, they could open a center, which is the Chicago Torture Justice Center, that provides support to survivors and their families, but it's also, or became also, and this is what I was involved with, a center for producing oral memories and recovering the archive of what had happened to these survivors uh, here in the city of Chicago. So that's the other project I have been involved with, and we have been conducting liberatory memory workshops with survivors, their families, and with other survivors of police violence in the city now for uh, five years now. Um, so that's the other side of the kind of work I've been doing. And this work, which has been very challenging for me as a philosopher, I was not prepared as a philosopher to do this kind of work, and that was part of the challenge that now has become my project on grammars of listening. So that's why for me it's so important to give this context, because the first thing I want to say is that my first feeling regarding this kind of work was that as a philosopher I had nothing to, to um, provide in this context. Uh, first, I was just um, very uh, humbled by the experience and I felt I was unable to really uh, deal theoretically with these kind of questions and with the questions that were coming out, especially for me at the moment of listening to, uh, testi to testimonies, listening to what I call traumatic violence. And um, this is where little by little I started to realize in an interdisciplinary work which is the kind of work that I did both at the Historical Memory Center in Colombia and with the Chicago Torture Justice Center in Chicago, that philosophy actually has a lot to say just because we may be asking questions that other disciplines and other people working from other disciplines are not asking. And these are the kind of questions that I'm going to share with you here very quickly. Um, so the first thing that I want to clarify is that by trauma, I do not mean like a diagnosis that pathologizes the survivor, determining beforehand the role, generally passive in their own process of healing. I mean rather, and this is where I start insisting on my philosophical approach to the question of trauma, I mean a particular type of experience or rather a particular structure of experience then it's deep in its devastating effects profoundly colonizes the subjectivities, identities, bodies, and languages it cuts through. And what I learned via literary studies on trauma, like those of Kathy Carut, who I quote a lot in this first part of my paper, with trauma, the very notion of experience is put into question. Trauma forces us to reconsider the ways in which we speak of experience and therefore the ways in which we think of history and memory. So the challenges of listening to trauma from a specifically a philosophical perspective, they have to do with the question concerning the mechanisms that first make possible the task of the production of memory in contexts where violence deeply traverses and affects what I call the very possibility of the production of sense. By production of sense, I mean both aesthetic and epistemological framework. So sense here in all its senses that is the modes of perception and the conceptual structures required for the elaboration of memory, 
both from the perspective of the survivors and those who are summoned and responsible of listening to their testimonies. So I describe this encounter with trauma, trauma experience as three main paradoxes. And this is the way I have discovered is kind of more straightforward to, kind, to understand the kind of challenges, epistemic and aesthetic, as I say, that come out of this encounter with the experience of listening to trauma. The first is the paradox of, I call it the paradox of belatedness. And it has to do with an excess and an absence of memory. On the one hand, with trauma experience, one discovers the impossibility of the survivor to leave the event behind as a past. The event is relieved compulsively and repeatedly as present. It is not lived as a memory, as a past, as a remembrance. It is relived literally, as already Freud describes this, as a compulsive repetition. And this paradoxically goes together with the inability to elaborate it as an experience. So the event has not yet, in strictly speaking, been lived, has not yet been experienced. And therefore, this form of belatedness that accompanies the experience of trauma, which is a very specific form of temporality, in which we are trapped between these too soon and too late. This, I cannot leave the event behind, it determines me, it occupies me, colonizes me in its presence and as a present, but at the same time, I cannot remember it. I cannot therefore have any agency over it. In the most, let's say, extreme form of traumatic um, symptoms, let's say. So how to build a memory of a non-experience, of something that has not yet, strictly speaking, speaking, happened? And that's kind of the first form of questions that come out of this. The second paradox is what I call the paradox of representation. And it's the encounter between an absence and an absence of sense. So what I mean by this is, on the one hand, there is an impossibility of finding in language the right meanings. And by this, I don't only mean the words, but if I insist also in the paper, the insufficiency, not of language only, but of our grammars, the structures of meaning themselves need to be rethought in order to really make audible what has happened. Um, but this is, this goes together again paradoxically with the fact that a certain radical form of violence um, is not only destructive but also profoundly creative in a perversive way, in the way in which Hannah Arendt talks about the horrible originality of a radical form of violence. Uh, the introduction of something radically new and thought of that sometimes we can't, we have not even imagined possible that requires the search for new categories, for new meanings. In that sense, trauma exceeds all the possibilities of its representation. So how to make these fractures of meaning available, how to listen to them, how to give them or allow them to find a voice, a language, a form of representation without betraying those fractures and gaps of sense, without making them speak a language that is available on beforehand. Um, or as I will say in the next paradox, without speaking for the one who is addressing us. So that's the third paradox, the paradox of the address. And this is a paradox that Caruth uh, describes as an address that remains enigmatic and to a certain extent needs to remain enigmatic, but yet demands a listening and a response. So how to think of an experience of listening that is capable of bearing witness, of carrying the voice without the speaking for another. Hector, are you keeping time? Uh, yes, and um, we could be running out of it, but uh, okay. we'll, we'll accommodate. Like in, in one minute, two minutes, or zero? Let's, 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 let's say two. <laughs> ah, perfect. Okay, so that's, that's fine. That's good. Thank you. So these three paradoxes co go with what I call the colonizing aspect of trauma. And it already in Freud's analysis, not only is the traumatic experience related to a violent eruption in the psyche 
and with it the establishment of its violence as unforgettable, as we just saw, but it brings with itself the additional element of the erasure of the traces of the original eruption. This, in, this ensures precisely that the establishment of the original violence is definitive because it is inaccessible. And so this is kind of the colonizing aspect that I, I, I relate afterwards in the second part of the project to, so it's not only that I will also, in the second part of the project, I speak of the coloniality of trauma and trauma as coloniality. So these are two sides of the project, so to say. So a philosophical perspective on the question of listening in traumatic context just leads to an understanding of the necessity and urgency of a critical analysis of the criteria and conditions of possibility for something to become audible, which is to say to become legible and recognizable. There were the very concepts of legibility and audibility must enter into a critical reformulation of their criteria of determination. This criteria of determination, moreover, involved in the case of trauma, the need for a critical revision of the structures that determine an experience and make it legible, rememberable, grievable, including its aesthetic frames, its spatio-temporal frames. So in this context, my project of grammars of listening insists in the first place on asking how philosophy can help us understand this aspect of the task of memory that otherwise risks remaining unnoticed. It insists in the second place on asking how one could imagine and identify in practice much more responsible, inclusive and plural courses of action and listening strategies. Above all, courses of action and listening strategies adequate to the radicality of a violence that while it awaits becoming audible, still remains unheard and unheard of. This is the double meaning of inaudito in Spanish that I kind of play with when I talk about this. And that's the first part, let's say, of the project. The second part is more connected to how these grammars of listening can be seen as the colonial grammars. And we can talk about that during the discussion if that's needed. And it is in the paper in case anyone wants to go and see what's going on there. Thank you. Let me stop sharing the screen. I don't know how to do that right now. Here, here, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Maria Rosario, very much. The, the, the roaring sum of applause, as always. Um, Tim. <laughs> thanks. Um, thanks to all of you for having invited me. Thank you, Hector, uh, Jimena. And Romina for for this uh, invitation. It was unexpected and 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 fantastic to receive. So um, maybe I should begin by just explaining uh, what I sent along. I was I was struggling a bit um, to send something, not because I didn't have anything written, but just I, what I thought might make more sense for you to read in terms of what I was working on. Um, and so, the, sort of at the end of it all, I decided that I would send something that that uh, the philosopher Roberto Esposito had written, um, and, and that piece, which appeared in Anali, which I Detailistica, uh, which I sent, was originally intended as the introduction to a translation of a book of his from 1991 called Nine Thoughts of the Political, and I had been asked this is going back probably 12 years, to write uh, an introduction. So there was the idea was that there were going to be, I don't know, du dueling introductions is probably not a fair way to put it, but there was going to be, uh, suppose it would have his introduction, and, and then I would kind of introduce as well um, the book. And you know how translations go, um, it was on, it was off, it was on, it was off. And then eight months ago, uh, um, I got an email saying, oh, the translation is back on, would you be willing to put together uh, an a new introduction. Um, and so what, what I've been thinking about and working on over the last um, probably a couple of months is what this a new introduction to Esposito and, and um, it, in the intervening years, it's no longer been nine thoughts, it's now become 10 thoughts, by the way. So uh, it's 10 thoughts of the political. Um, so what, what, what might I say about that? And so originally, you know, his, his, the, his introduction was going to be, for, it is, and what you read, it's from the unpolitical to, to biopolitics. And mine was going to be from biopolitics to the, the impolitical to sort of reverse them because in the reception of, of biopolitics and impolitical biopolitics precedes um, the impolitical in, in, in this country. 
Um, so that's where uh, the piece was originally um, originally coming from. Um, it's um, I, I, there, there are a number of things that I would want to say about this. Um, there's a kind of a contextualization around the term, uh, impolitical or unpolitical. I'm, as you'll see, I'll, I prefer the, the impolitical for a variety of reasons. But there's a contextualization around it that's an interesting one. Um, and um, if I had more time, I would I would share it with you. But but I could just say that it, it grows out of a, of an um, of an interest, an Italian philosophical interest in um, in the late 1970s on the work of Thomas Mann and the idea of the own politician. Um, and so that gets translated as impolitical um, through a variety of philosophers, and then it gets taken up by Esposito. So, um, so the work that I'm working on right now is, um, is really sort of, is there a way that the impolitical might tell us something uh, about biopolitical reflection? Um, and, or is it, has it just simply been kind of subsumed? And in political critique in in uh, biopolitics, and so um, I sent that along from Esposito. I think it needs to be taken with um, you know a pretty a pretty big grain of salt. Um, he he sort of said goodbye to the impolitical many years ago, um, and and to be honest, can't understand um, others' interest in this term these days anymore. But I tend to I tend to to uh, to find it um, the kind of the critical apparatus that it provides is is uh, is useful. So. Uh, maybe in the time that I that I, I've set up, what I would do um, is I'd like to say something about this term, the impolitical. So I'm not going to use unpolitical, the impolitical. Um, to, a couple of thoughts about its meaning and its kind of an etymology of that. Um, once I've done that, um, I'll turn to um, sort of specific examples of of one particular. Um, piece of that, which is neutralizing conflict, and give you a brief taste from exposing those kind of um, that period, so the late 1980s, and what he what he means by that, and then, um, sorry, and then I'll, I'll pivot to what a potential impolitical critique of biopolitics and biopower might look like today. Um, so, you've had a chance to look at that, um, and and uh, the piece from Esposito, and I think one of the things that might you might have might have stood out is is the is a resonance here between the term impolitical and the term immunity. I mean, that's something that I sort of was thinking about. Well, what is, what is it that, that these two terms share? And I came across something really uh, interesting really recently. Um, it's a, um, there's a wonderful discussion of, of, the, of the prefix uh, IMP, imp, no? in um, Stanley Cavell's Transcendental Etudes. Um, he's reading Edgar Allan Poe. Let me share a bit with this, of this with you. And you'll see, I think, why it's so interesting. Um, so here's Cavell. It may well be that the prefix uh, im that is initially felt to be perverse, since like the prefix in, it has opposite meanings. With adjectives, it is a negation or privative, as in immediate, immaculate, imperfect, imprecise, improper, implacable, impious. With verbs, it is an affirmation or intensive, as in imprison, impinge, imbue, implant, implicate, impersonate. It is not impossible that perverse applied to language should be followed out as meaning poetic through and through. In plain air, we keep the privative and the intensive well enough apart, but in certain circumstances, say in dreams, uh, in which according to Freud, logical operators like negation cannot be registered or pictured, but must be supplied later by the dreamer's interpretation, we might grow confused about whether, for example, immuring means putting something into a wall or letting something out of one, or whether impotence means a powerlessness or a special power directed to something special, or whether implanting is the giving or the removing of life, or whether impersonate means putting on another personality or being without personhood. So, following uh, Cavell's that reading, that suggestive reading, um, let me propose the imp of the impolitical this way. Um, it's first, it's meant to negate the political in ways that exposes, though, I think, Marx in that, in that uh, piece of his and certainly more at length than other places and, and categories of the political, an earlier book and then 10 Thoughts of the Political. 
it will refer to that which is not political, which works against the political, um, where the political would refer to the way people are together. And here, the Exposito has a, a clear debt to Hannah Arendt. Here's Arendt's definition of politics. Quote, politics deals with the coexistence and association of different men. Um, sorry, um, uh, men organize themselves politically according to certain essential commonalities found within or abstracted from an absolute chaos of difference, uh, end quote. And so in political would deal with how um, men and women do not coexist or fail to coexist or associate, how organization breaks down um, or how there are certain essential commonalities that are not available. That would be the way the impolitical would function. On the other hand, notice what happens when we say uh, impolitical as a verb, impoliticization. It's, it's, not a, it's not a phrase that a word that Esposito uses, but uh, he prefers depoliticization, obviously. But if there were such a word, it would be the intensification of the political, right? The way, in, in precisely in the way that they, that um, people don't come together politically, there's the, there, within that, um, antithetically, is another way that they might be able to come together, the ways organization can be intensified, the way certain kinds of commonalities become available. So, um, you know, that, that, that reading of Imp translates uh, in the latter part of that essay uh, into, you know, his, um, his kind of a seminal moment around immunity. So you have immunity as being the negation of community. The more immunized you are, the, more, the less likely it is that you will um, you will be responsible for what is required of you, the gift that you, that you would give in the community. So that makes sense. But then there's also another piece in Esposito's reading of immunization, right, in which the, the, it becomes possible to think of an immunization that would be affirmative. So that would be one piece, it seems to me, to keep in mind when we're talking about about the impolitical, that it, it seems to be have these, you know, it's double valenced. Um, so the second piece, and we have certainly, I'm happy to talk about, you know, this uh, some more during the, the Q&A. Um, the second piece, it, it comes up a couple of times in the, in that, you know, in, in probably the first five pages of the piece before he dismisses it, right? Um, and it has to do with the neutralization of conflict. And it's a, a piece that I've been interested in, this, this notion that politics, you know, uh, to the degree that one speaks about politic conflict has already been neutralized. And just where is that coming from? There's an earlier work from um, 85 called Order and Conflict, um, um, Machiavelli and the Political Literature of the Italian Renaissance. It's the um, relatively unknown work of the Spoliatos. But he, he spends uh, some time talking, uh, comparing conflict and order um, from Hobbes to Machiavelli. Let me read you a brief piece and then, and then say some things about it. Um, so is this supposed to, it is precisely this question of the compatibility of conflict and politics that is the object of Hobbes's polemic. There's either politics or there is conflict. Uh, the transition or better the jump from the natural state to that of the civil state places the division along a temporal line. Where there is conflict, there still is no politics. When there is politics, no longer is there any conflict. That's a supposed to So where Hobbes sees conflict as neutralizable in and through politics, then Machiavelli will see it, will see the unequal forces of the different social parts determining the blocking of, of what Esposito will say is this conflictual dialectic. So the difference um, between the impolitical and the impolitical will be located. In, the, in this distinction that Esposito will keep coming back to, which is between a conflict that is neutralized in the political and one that does not move towards an ultimate synthesis in a political ordering. So conflict for Esposito understood as the logical primum out of which uh, order emerges. So in, in that book that, um, that I mentioned, the 10 Thoughts book, Esposito extends this reading of conflict in order from these earlier scenes of Machiavelli across modernity. And the result is to see uh, how deeply the categories of the political for him are riven through by their incapacity to neutralize conflict. Conflict continually 
plays havoc with uh, political uh, concepts. Um, and how does it do that? Because it, um, th through, through this notion of representation, uh, that's going to be one of the key terms for Esposito, to the degree that conflict is represented, con uh, it is ordered and neutralized. So there's implicit in that um, is, is this kind of the mission of the impolitical, if you want, to avoid, to evade, to block representation, to, to, to block name, naming um, conflict um, in political terms. Okay, so those are the, the, two, the two sort of major pieces that I, I, I wanted to take from the impolitical. There are more, um, and there's, I should just to be fair to, to others writing um, in an impolitical uh, lineage, I mean, there's certainly you would, you would want to look at an, um, Massimo Cacciari's reading of Thomas Mann in the impolitical, uh, specifically around um, so where he where Kachari winds up, which is not conflict, but is rather this kind of depoliticization that eventually uh, kind of arrives at a subject that is um, that is no longer um, politicized. Um, that it becomes, in his in his words, a worker. In any case, so there is another tradition here, um, and not and not just simply as close as this. So. Um, Here's just sort of my, the second piece, and that's the the pivot to biopolitics. Um, so, what would an impolitical critique of biopolitics and biopower look like, um, especially in this moment of of immunological crisis? Um, so, first, by focusing on the impolitical, um, you would you it, it would allow you or it would ask you rather to um, to reintroduce conflict into the heart of biopower or biopolitics. And you might ask yourself, well, why would there be a need to do that? Um, well, it's, in my view, oftentimes what happens when one talks about biopower, when I'm teaching, um, you know, the Foucault or the, the Agamemnon especially, what comes across to students is, is how, how hopeless <laughs> and how totalizing it, it appears uh, to them. And they're not wrong on that. So, um, and I, I wonder if, it's a question, if, if, if part of the reason that biopower and biopolitics seem so, so uh, inevitable is that, is that they represent uh, conflict in, in a way that orders conflict and domesticates conflict. And the question then would be, well, how does it do it? How do those concepts do it? And the, and the way that they do that, it seems to me, is by seeing conflict in terms of, and only in terms of life, of, of two forms of life life itself, right? So in, in, in you see this in, in the emphasis that biopolitical reflection uh, places on, on the naturalized form of life, Zoe famously, right? A being shorn of political attributes, um, which succeeds in politicizing forms of life further. So this lack of political attributes um, or the emphasis on the potentiality of Zoe replaces other potential forms of life. Um, and so there's the, the possibility, I think why, why I'm so taken with this term, um, is there's the possibility that the thinking, the political, might help us to see that the roots of, bio, well, some of the roots of power, not all of them, but perhaps some of the roots of biopower may reside in the ease with which representations of Zoe neutralize conflict. I mean, if, you, if you're Zoe, you, 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 the potential for conflict has been, has been has, has already been taken care of, which you don't, you don't have precisely because you're, you're not a political, a political form of life. So when Agamben um, extends Homo sacer to vast populations as the emerging or future form of life, or to say that we're all Homo sacer during um, the invention of the, uh, of the epidemic, as he says. He denies that other forms of, of life uh, may result. And so the representation is, representation is already complete. Um, I guess one of the things, I got my eye on the clock, I'll, I'll finish up. Um, but I guess one of the things that, that the impolitical, it's a question um, I've been thinking about is, is that to the degree that the impolitical sort of refuses or evades or pa waits patiently before naming um, you know, uh, conflict uh, and ordering it, that there's a potential for kind of play there. 
so that you would have, you know, it wouldn't, it, it would be, no, I'm not, in, I'm not exactly sure about that. I want to say this so 100%, but it, I wonder if there isn't something in, in biopolitics that's tragic and something within the impolitical that might not be precisely comic, but maybe moving towards something comic. And, and um, he may have mentioned earlier this, the, the kind of this, this recent work, um, it's been now become a joint project with, with Grant Ferret called The Comic Self. And, and there, you know, I think one of the things that we've been working on is, um, it, it is is the relationship between uh, sort of the comic self that is able to dispossess itself of a certain kind of representation on what the self is, as opposed to the tragic self, which repeats um, in a certain way the same kind of possession around um, identity. Let's say. So I mean, I have a, I have you know more thoughts more thoughts about this. Um, and maybe maybe it's just the last piece, and then I, I promise I'll stop. Um, you know, I think Esposito sort of has given has said goodbye to it, but I think you know in his later some of his most recent work, um, the stuff on on institutions and and the machine the the, the two the the political theological machine. There is there is you know I think kind of operating underneath some of those readings, especially in the last one, Institution, in the search for paradox and the, the, the re kind of rehearsing of, of a dialectic around the political, something like an impolitical heart that's still there. Um, and, and if I may, just kind of polemically, I also have some issues, some doubts about by attaching something like an, the term affirmative to the biopolitics is somehow that's, that's meant to kind of stop the impolitical critique. I, I don't, I don't necessarily buy that. Um, anyway, th that's sort of where my, my research is, is running these days. Um, I try to keep it as informed as I can. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Tim, very much. Thank you. The, vir the, the virtual class. Um, Romy, would you mind uh, having our attendees become panelists so we can, we can see some more faces and I, I'm, Imagining that some will choose to remain their cameras off. That's yes, okay. uh, that, that's what I was going to say. If people have problems with their internet connection, as it is my case today, feel free to turn your cameras off. Yeah, if you, if you can, it would be lovely to see you, obviously. Um, and, and, and by the same token, they can send their questions on the chat if they don't, you know, they can't do it with um, the microphone. Absolutely. Um, all right. So I'm pretty sure people have questions. If that's okay, I might uh, float a few to get the conversation started. And, um, and then we'll capture questions and we'll have a, 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 a few rounds of, of uh, questions and discussions. So um, I have a couple of questions for Maria Rosario. Um, and, and, you know, thank you for sharing this, this fascinating uh, work, both the published part and the, the work in progress uh, part. It's, it's really um, fascinating work. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the legal implications, Maria Rosario, because I know you've thought about um, literature and the law uh, before, and some of the materials that you're dealing with have a, like a juridical um, importance that would follow from the kind of findings that you're making about the praxis of listening and the conceptual underpinnings of listening, but listening also leads to, you know, legal acts. So I was just curious about that. Mm -hmm. Then I also wanted to maybe offer a little bit of pushback on the choice of grammar um, as the um, operating metaphor here. Um, I, I wonder if it is a grammar, if you need a grammar, if the project needs a grammar, if, um, if there's something other, I, I also wouldn't be happy with poetics. I don't think that poetics would be a, a good metaphor, but I wonder, you know, if, if it is indeed a grammar and, and just maybe take a little bit of issue with, with that operating metaphor. Um, also two questions, uh, for, for Tim, um, in light of, uh, towards the end of your talk, you made this really fascinating mm. opposition between the possibly tragic nature of biopolitics versus the, the co comic nature of the impolitical. 
I was reminded that yeah. Democritus was known as the laughing philosopher in, in, in ancient times, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yes. Very dear to my heart, a, a fellow materialist. Um, and I guess this is a question comment, but I wonder if, you know, what, what is at stake here is the performative, the, the speech act mm -hmm. dimension of these two modes of thinking. Um, when, you know, Schmidt famously defines the political as you know, using the opposition of friend versus foe. And, and we were just mm -hmm. talking about this in a class yesterday. That's why it's so fresh in my mind. Um, it has this self-fulfilling prophecy quality to it that once it is articulated, um, the interlocutor will have to give it validity, even if trying to discredit it. It's, it's also a circular, mm -hmm. kind of like fallacious yeah. argument, I, I, I would think. Yeah. It's kind of like, you know, the, the old fallacy yeah. of, uh, since when did you stop beating X, Y, and Z? And you're like, oh no, I've never, <laughs> yeah. you know. But anyways, you, you, you see, I guess, what the yes. comment slash question is. It's about yeah. the, the, the language performativity aspect of what you're discussing. And then I have to ask this, um, and feel free to answer to any of these or none, about not the pandemic, as the biopolitical context, but mm -hmm. I guess the election, um, mm -hmm. I would be curious, you know, based on your um, long trajectory of thinking about the impolitical, but, uh, and, uh, but about politics as well, if you had any thoughts that you'd, you'd like to share. And an invitation for the two of you would be if you'd like to ask each other questions. I, we always find that it's, you know, really the, the, the heart of these uh, uh, discussions. So I'll leave it at that just to uh, get things going. Yeah, so thank you. And I do have questions for Tim, so I'll take advantage of my, yes. my access to the word right now. But first I'll ask, I'll answer very quickly um, Hector's questions, which are complicated, so I will just mention a couple of things around them. Uh, the legal implications, so Hector, as you know, and that's, as you mentioned, I also work a lot with um, the relation between law and literature and um, the connection between the grammars of listening project and the, the that other side of my work is, is still unclear to me however one of the things i've been working a lot on and i work a lot on this with my very dear colleague esteban restrepo from the universidad de los andes he's in the law school and he has a beautiful project connected to how the failure of the representation in the case of the law is the site where the law can actually become a fair scenery or a fair scenario for um, speaking to trauma or speaking about trauma. So coming out of works like Shoshana Feldman, for instance, if anyone knows about her work, it's more how the, the, the very failure of the law to represent becomes a form of representation that can itself um, attempt to speak to trauma or to, to the kind of damage that trauma uh, produces, let's say, in its survivors. Um, this is just to say a first something that he and I have been thinking about because in a way, when I talk about grammars, and this is my beginning of an answer to your second question, which I mean, you cannot, ask, you cannot say is problematic and not say why, Hector. So you have to say why you think it's problematic. Not just like, why not poetics? Why not? Yeah, but what's problematic about grammars for you? So I want to hear more about that. But when I talk about grammars, I also want to insist my emphasis is on this notion of the frameworks of sex. And as I said before, it's not just frameworks of meaning or meaning understood in a very broad sense it would have to be, but sense more generally because it is both aesthetic and 
it is in the frameworks of perception as much as it is in the frameworks of conceptualization, let's say. So it is, um, I want to insist on the notion of grammars because I want to insist that the radical challenge to be able to listen to trauma comes not only with a breakdown of language or of communication, but with the need to produce at the very site and every single time a new, so this is not a grammar, right? It is grammars every single time a new that are able to, to, to create frameworks where they, where any framework that is available is no longer um, fit to make audible what testimony is attempting to communicate in that very singular instance. And I don't wanna get too much into detail here, but I insist on grammar because coming out of Kant's third critique, uh, and Kant in the third critique, he talks about the judgment of the beautiful or the judgment of taste in connection to something he calls a rule but it is a rule, he calls it exemplarity. He says that every single time beauty is exemplar because the singularity of the experience is searching for a rule that cannot be brought in, but that it needs in order to be communicable. And so this search for the rule without losing the singularity, without being subsumed by the concept, but not giving up the possibility that a rule gives in order to make it universally communicable. That's the context in which I want to insist on the notion of grammar. And I relate grammar to that notion of rule, but an aesthetic exemplarity sense of what the rule is. Uh, of course, I get more into details about this in the book to explain why grammars, because that's the question I get every time. It annoys so much. And so I kind of like it even more because of that, that every single time people, why not aesthetics? Why not poetics? Why not? Uh, so I, I am now even more sure that I want to continue using grammar, but not as a stubbornness, more like it does make sense to me in a lot of ways. I do want to know why is it problematic though for you? Why is it specifically for you that, that grammar is kind of, doesn't work. And I want to say it's not a metaphor. It's not exactly a metaphor. And I'm not an expert on literary figures. But I don't think I use it as a metaphor. I think it's more li literal than uh, just a metaphor when I say grammar. Um, I do have a question for Tim. Do I get to ask it now? Yes, please. That way Tim will be busy with a, a barrage of questions. <laughs> So well, I have many questions, but just one for now, Tim. And I'm so glad that book is being translated finally in English because I always assign readings from that book. And I always ask if anyone in the room reads Italian or Spanish so they can actually do a presentation of some of the concepts in that book because it's a really, really useful book, I think, for Espositus studies. But so one of the things I that worries me in this, um, so I do get the neutralization of conflict that comes with representation. And I do get how that is very connected to what Esposito has called the impolitical since the beginning and the need for uh, going to, let's say, the dark side of concepts, right? The, the side that is not made audible, the side that remains uh, silenced because of the excess of intelligibility that comes on the other side, from the other side. However, um, and, I, and I'm thinking precisely on that chapter on myth in the nine thoughts on the political that now have become 10. And in that chapter, I would say Esposito is playing a uh, or is showing a gesture that would be in between the radical interruption of representation that you're talking about when you say the task of the impolitical would be to 
you say, to escape representation, precisely to reintroduce conflict in the heart of power. But if we go to that chapter, Esposito would do something a little bit different. He would say, we need to interrupt the myth. And let's say myth here can play the role of representation because the myth is what gives us the word in the first place, right? But we also need the myth, he says. We cannot operate without it. And so my question would be whether that notion of comic that you're trying to bring in, I would not read it in terms of comic, and here comes my Schillerian, Leah. I would read it in terms of play, as you said at the beginning. You said play and not comic. And I think play here would be very useful because play precisely, and when you read Schiller correctly, not in the way that it has been read in 20th century and reduced, uh, play would remain in that tension that would be connected to this, this gesture by Spositov, we need the myth even though we have to interrupt the myth. The myth needs to be constantly interrupted even though we need it. So maybe this is not exactly the way one formulates a question, but I know there is kind of a question behind what I just said. Um, I'll just stop there. Uh, Tim, I believe you're muted. <laughs> Unmute. Thank you. Thank you about that. Sorry about that. Yeah, no. Um, so I was just saying, um, so the first question was really about, um, was the question about the comic and, I mean, the, there's, a com there's a question here about the comic and, and the tragic in relation to into the relation to the biopolitical and the impolitical, right? So that's the first question. Um, and and I, the couple of ways of, you know, of approaching this, it seems to me. So the, the, first, the first way would be, um, I, can, I, can, I can tell you that, that there's, a, you know, there's a specific moment in fading character of Benjamin that's really useful, that, that I, we've found really useful to, to um, uh, for the sort of thinking about the impolitical, and I've, I just happen to have it close at hand, um, so I'll read it. Um, while, uh, while fate brings to light the immense complexity of the guilty person, the complications and bonds of his guilt, character gives this mystical enslavement of the person to the guilt context, the answer of genius. Complication becomes simplicity and fate freedom. For the character of the comic figure is not the scarecrow of the determinist, it is the beacon in whose beams the freedom of his actions becomes visible. So, I mean, what I take from that is that in this in this uh, in this moment in which the 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 impolitical uh, the impolitical figure, the impolitical critique is offered, it becomes possible to open up a space in which what one th a space for not knowing, right, for uh, for defamiliarizing what one takes, what one has assumed prior to that to know as being inevitable. So, and there's a, you know, I think we're kind of thinking the way that I'm sort of thinking about the impolitical as a practice, there's a, a clear association with something like defamiliarization coming out of a Russian formalist tradition. Um, and certainly the way that, that Bakhtin speaks about the comic uh, is something that that I say I found really useful, but I, I need to make this week because um, since I'm writing this with uh, with Grant, so it's something that that we've been using it to think of it in the political as a kind of what would it mean to be a practice. So to return to the question about the the tragic, I mean, yeah, I think there. Well, let me add something else because there's another there's another piece that I've, I failed to mention, and that is that the 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 reading of the comic and the tragic. Um, is growing out also out of um, different repetition from Blues. And so you have a certain kind of repetition about the 18th Brumaire and a certain kind of repetition that is tragic and, and another that is comic. And so that piece about repetition is an interesting, uh, is an interesting one. Uh, so is it, po it becomes a question, Does, where, is it possible to think where tragic, 
tragic biopolitics works in terms of a certain kind of representation, that the impolitical works rather around a certain kind of repetition. That's sort of the question that we've been, we've been asking ourselves. And so that, that possibility then, you could, that, that, that might um, open up even, even more space for naming something that, that, um, that wouldn't neutralize conflict or, or holding that space open. That would sort of be one thought. This to the tragic um, comes out of the Schmidt you mentioned. Um, so the friend enemy and, and um, the, the impersonal, which is, a, which is another piece in this, which I, I, I didn't I spend any time on and I wish I could have, um, but the impersonal really, it, for Esposito, has taken on much, much greater kind of affirmative potential, even more than immunization since the earlier works. And so I think that impersonal piece is, um, if you're going to look for something like an impolitical moment or a, a comedic moment in Esposito, it, it sometimes it, it, it appears kind of out of nowhere around the impersonal. So the, so the impersonal would be the way that uh, Esposito would make it affirmative and block the kind of tragic biopolitics and biopolitics that you would get from that you get in people like Agamben. Um, so in terms of the, in terms of, I, I'm not going to say anything about the election, <laughs> um, um, only because, only because, uh, I mean, I, 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 I'm not, I, you know, I, I have some thoughts about it, but I, I don't know that I'm comfortable sort of relaying them right now in on an in an impolitical voice um, um, so I think I'll, I'll hold off a bit on that but in terms of the of the myth that's that that the, the myth piece is, is is a really crucial piece it's one of the crucial piece most crucial pieces in that book thank you for for Maria to tell us uh, reminding me of that I mean the, the it's it's interesting that 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 piece of Esposito's was the subject of a, of a long polemic between him and Cacciari um, on it. And so I think what Cacciari is saying, you're, 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 you're attempting, you want to have your cake and eat it too. You, you're kind of denying that there is a representation in the way the you're using the impolitical, yet at the same time, the fact, the mere fact that we're having a, you know, a discussion about the impolitical critiquing the political, it, there must that you, you, you're drawing on a representation. So in suppose, and I suppose these are those responses to say, well, I've got this idea that it's kind of inoperative um, and, as a way of kind of just a, a avoiding and evading that piece. But I mean, I think what your, your larger point, is, it seems to me is, is there a way um, of holding apart or using myth in the way that I suppose it is doing that it doesn't it doesn't move to something like comedy, but something like something like play. That there may be something really implicit in the way that Esposito is using myth in, the, in those pages to to play uh, among um, among these different representations without calling that. I think that's I think that's I think that's right. Um, I don't I, I could go on you know for, for a while on this, but I but I think there's a reason why um, you know I've I've moved to the comic. Or the comic self, rather than than play, and and I think some of that has to do with these long-standing connections that the comic has to to possession and to and to the common. And I I, I feel like that that piece is one that that needs to be kind of highlighted. I mean, I don't know. That you, I mean, you get to play gets you some places. I mean, I've written on play, but. It doesn't. It doesn't. It kind of misses that that extra punch that that the comic or the comic self, uh, I think, can give it. That's not an answer to your your question. I know, but but there you are. Uh, all right. Um, the floor is open, and also Tim, if at any point you'd like to ask anything of Maria Rosario, we'll, we'll the, you'll you'll step in front of the queue. Uh, okay. Um, and a, qu Thank a, a you. quick response. I do have um, a couple of questions. Go ahead. Oh, and we have something like ten minutes left. Um, so I'm all ears. I'll, I'll do a quick response, Maria Rosario, to your question about uh, grammar. Um, I guess my concern is the baggage of the term. Um, it it can be tied to structuralism, to Wittgenstein, to Chomsky. It can be normative, descriptive, prescriptive. So I have nothing against grammar. I'm actually a big fan, but I, I, I would maybe 
um, I, I really liked how, how you unpacked what you mean by grammar. That's, that, that maybe I, I, I would love to see at the, at the foreground at, rather than at the background, but that might be just me take it obviously with a grain of salt. Um, did I see any hands or any, any questions, comments? Um, like, like we said, if you don't want to speak out in your microphone, you can always, um, you know, write it on the chat. Seems to work many times. I see Daniel. And, and also, Daniel, Hi, would you mind introdu 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 introducing yourself very quickly? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't listen to you. No, I was just wondering if you could introduce yourself also, because I think uh, uh, Tim and Maria Rosario haven't met you. <laughs> oh. Oh, 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 oh. Sorry, we, we, have, we have some trouble with sound <laughs> here. I, I couldn't hear you. Daniel is a uh, fifth year graduate student in Iberian and Latin American cultures who is writing about media studies and literature in the Amazon and the Andes. Um, so I was just introducing you, Daniel. Um, um, yes, <laughs> thank you. And in Cuba as well. Um, thank you for your talk, uh, Timothy and Maria Rosario. I had a question to Maria Rosario, a little bit selfish since it's connected to what I do. And it's uh, what would be the place of technology and audiovisual technology in the process of listening. Uh, because I know that El Centro Memoria Historica does a lot of audiovisual um, different things, uh, you, you know, like recordings, podcasts, uh, interviews, uh, movies, uh, documentaries, as a way for bringing the voice of people that are generally unheard by the urban elites and the urban populations of Colombia. Uh, so they can know better what is happening in the conflict, which generally happens in the rural part. So I don't know, I, I was wondering what would be the role of these technologies in, 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 in the way you understand listening. Gracias, Daniel. Yes, it's a great question. In the book I go through, so in the book there is one chapter and then an interlude, one chapter and then an interlude, and each one of those interludes is kind of a conversation with one work of art. Because part of what I claim around along the book is that where philosophy can start understanding how these grammars of listening would look like or would sound like and how they would how they would introduce effectively a, a radical change of frameworks in our perception as well as in our categorization is precisely through works of art. And so I do, I kind of, I'm permanently, and my work has always been permanently in conversation with contemporary Colombian art. Uh, and this is the beginning of my answer to you because precisely in each one of those cases, I work with what I would call different forms of technology. Uh, technology understood, of course, very broadly because it depends on the work of art we're talking about. Uh, but definitely there, I study how like, uh, this location of the usual ways in which we relate to the audible, for instance, or the connection between the visual, the audible, and the haptic, the tactic, or what I call more uh, broadly in the book, the aural, which is connected to the senses, not really in terms of the difference between visuality or audibility or haptic, but more in terms of resonance. So it is more like um, auditive grammar for reorganizing the senses altogether. Um, so how technology and media can alter so radically our experience of perception in such a way that they become themselves those grammars of listening. They disorganize our senses in such a way that they make audible what otherwise wouldn't be audible. And they point to ways in which that experience can effectively, ha effectively happen. 
So more than traditionally going to like um, the documentaries that the center does, which I've been involved with and I think is very interesting. I, I try to go to even more radical experiences of what disorganizing the census and disorganizing categories would look like um, in order to, to think what making audible um, means in these specific um, cases that I'm talking about. So that's kind of the beginning of an answer. But I think art, contemporary art, literature, theater, which is the examples I deal with, they are not really examples. Uh, they rather are challenges to theory. Um, they are precisely producing those grammars in very interesting ways and politically involved ways too. So, um, well, while we wait for maybe another, another question, um, I'm going to try and see if I can connect the two talks, but who knows, right? Maybe, maybe it will, maybe it will not. Um, and of course, needless to say, I really, um, enjoyed both the presentations and, and the readings you sent. I was wondering if, um, there would be a way to connect them, not necessarily via Caruth, but via Berland in the sense that Berland assumes that trauma is durational and not exceptional, and therefore there's a sense of stuckness. Um, if that um, form of life in this stuck way that to me um, calls in all of this very tactile and very much abject forms could be somehow related to this um, uh, problem that that Tim pointed out that um, that the in political allows us to see is that um, that when 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 we um, really are able to represent this stuckness, then we kind of lose the, the, the political value of that stuckness uh, paradoxically. So how would you see the possibility of thinking um, stuck, this, this stuckness in, in, I don't want to say in a, in a comic way, but in this other um, way in which you allow for a gap or a space between, um, you know, representation and institutionalization and the possibility of um, staying with that stuckness. Would that, would that kind of, would that be able, would that possibly connect the two talks in a way? Um, and I'm thinking, of course, of the pandemic many, many times over and, and um, there's something, something that, that in my mind, you know, connects them, but I would love to hear from, from you both. So this is only a, com a comment, a very, you know, like- odd Yeah. Comment. Well, I mean, it, it's a friend of mine, um, Adam Seitz, uh, constantly remind, not constantly, he reminded me a couple of times that, you know, we're, we always speak about uh, tragic conflict, but not a comic conflict. And what that would look like, and um, you know, and then proceeds to remind me of um, you know a variety of violent conflicts, uh, comedies, I should say, like um, you know, just think of Aristophanes. So, um, I guess what I guess what I would say is, um, I mean, it isn't it isn't immediately obvious to me. And I'm thinking about this, like, so why why would you know why would is there if I could just push push this a bit. I mean, is is there a way of of reading the pandemic and and not it and, and it it not being a tragic con a, a tragedy or or where is the conflict today? Where does it reside if it isn't residing in this in in the in Agamben's invention of the epidemic in terms of Bios and Zoe? I mean, that's that's what the impolitical is kind of inviting inviting us to imagine. And you know, it's a, it's an it's an unsettling and uncomfortable question, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
right? You know, and and I don't have I don't have a I don't have ready ready examples for it. I, what I do think, though, is that you know there's there, there's an invitation. You said the stuckness of this. I mean, there's there's the I would like to hear more about that that stuckness. It's a it's a stuckness politically. Is it a you know it's a stuckness of thought. I mean, this is one of the things that I find really you know has been really helpful for me in in the years work you know translating Esposito is is um, it's, it, it's that, you know, the, imp the, the, the most impolitical act is to think. It's the most, it's the not, most non, he says that in the origin of the political, it's the most yeah. unproductive and impolitical act. And so, you know, there's, a, there's a, the impolitical, the, the mere, the mere questioning of this and asking af after the stuckness, as you say, is, is, to, is to engage in thinking, is to engage in, 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 in an impolitical act, right? Um, and, but it's, an unco it's a, a, obviously uncomfortable, you know, um, and that, that also, you know, those kind of moments are really become really interesting to sort of what's that level of, where is that unsettledness around, around my thinking coming from, you know? Um, it, it, um, I don't know, I mean, I, I don't want to bogart the time here, but I, I did want to, you know, there was something that it's just occurred to me in 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 um, Merida Savi's last piece about listening to trauma. You said and and this that breakthrough of um, are we running out of time? I'm sorry. Um, no. Um, no. Okay. Um, I'll be quick. No, but but I just it just recalled to me this distinction that that um, that that. Pasolini not only makes between communication and ex and expression, mm -hmm. um, and I guess my question is sort of where is the where do you sort of see expression vis-a-vis -vis the kinds of um, um, communication around trauma that you're talking about, um, and and you know I I don't that's not to say that that I want to link communication to tragedy and comedy to expression I wouldn't I wouldn't I wouldn't dare say that but it, it, I, I wonder. I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on where where's expression located. Does it immediately wind up on the on the aesthetic side? Um, is where 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 would the expression be located? Is sort of the the one thought I had. I don't know if um, Jimena or, or anyone else has any like parting thought, comment, or question maybe to to leave hanging as it were. Um, what, one thing that we've noticed on Zoom is um, that great things, if they're short, they're even greater, right? And I think we've had a, a, a really uh, fabulous conversation um, based on excellent talks, uh, very well-selected readings. We're very appreciative of your uh, time, care, and effort, again, under the circumstances. Um, and we are reaching, I think, the, the end of our meeting today. So unless anyone has any like pressing uh, thoughts, I'm going to ask Romina if she wouldn't mind um, sharing with us uh, what's next for Materia. Um, okay, so this is the last, uh, the last session of the quarter, if I am not mistaken. Um, and then we have a calendar including um, talks by um, two wonderful graduate students, Shamira Morris and um, Regan Ross, who will be talking about um, black mobilization in Latin America and in the US. We're also going to have a sort of combination between uh, German studies and Hispanic and Latin American studies. We're going to have two talks. We don't know yet about the exact topics, so Stay tuned. And we'll also have a, I'm going to be honest here. <laughs> and we are also going to have a grad-led student session led by Valeria Meilier from Georgetown and um, Fabian Mosquera from Pittsburgh. And they are going to be talking about Latin American studies, but also Italian cinema and the relationship between matter and materiality uh, in the 20th and 21st century. So yes, stay tuned. It's going to be interesting. And I apologize that I don't have any more details at this point. <laughs>
<laughs> that's that's quite all right. Uh, people have joined today from uh, Denmark, Italy, Palo Alto, Philadelphia, well, the Pennsylvania uh, area, um, uh, Chicago, um, and, and, and yet everything is quite Stanford based. I mean, of all those locales, most of the people are at Stanford. So it's, it's quite an experience that we're, we're all going through. Uh, all right, um, we're going to, uh, uh, Romina, if you wouldn't mind, uh, hit the stop recording button.